Hello and welcome to International Daily Roundup by People's Dispatch where we bring you major news developments from around the world. Our headlines 751 unmarked graves found in the site of former residential school in Canada. Activist Isar Binar killed during violent raid by Palestinian Authority forces. Report reveals use of brutal force against hunger strikers in US detention center. Members of Peru's election board suspended over conflict of interest and in our video section we take a look at the growing persecution of dissenters by the Bolsonaro government in prison. In our first story, 751 unmarked graves have been discovered at the site of a residential school in Canada, Saskatchewan province. The Kawais' First Nation announced the preliminary findings on June 24th. The Marival Indian Residential School was operational from 1899 to 1997. The Kawais' First Nation took over the school's cemetery from the Catholic Church in the 70s. They began to locate unmarked graves using ground-penetrating radar earlier this June. Kawais' chief Cadmus Delorme has stated that it is not confirmed if all the graves are those of children. Moreover, some of the graves might have been people from nearby towns. Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission identified 20 residential schools in Saskatchewan. As per official records, 566 Indigenous children died while in these schools. CBC Canada had previously reported that the remains of 191 children were unidentified. The major cause of death listed was tuberculosis made worse by unsafe living conditions and malnutrition. However, causes of death were also omitted from half the records. This week's discoveries have been made shortly after the remains of 215 children were discovered from the Kamloops Residential School. An estimated 150,000 indigenous children were held in such schools. They were forcibly separated from their families and some children had no contact with them for years. These schools were designed to force indigenous people to assimilate into the Christian Canadian culture. As such, children were banned from speaking their ancestral languages or maintaining cultural practices. Survivors' testimonies and records have revealed, have revealed horrific levels of abuse and neglect. 3,201 deaths have been officially recorded, while independent estimates place the number at least as twice as high. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission made 94 recommendations in its final report. So far, the Canadian government has implemented only 10. In our next story, Palestinian activist Nisar Banat died during a violent raid by Palestinian Authority forces on June 24th. His family stated that around 25 officers showed up to his house in Hebron in the early hours of Thursday. The doors and windows of their house were then blown up without warning. Banat's cousin told local media that he was beaten with iron and wooden batons and pepper sprayed, was on, his pepper sprayed on his face. He was then stripped off his clothes and dragged away into a vehicle. A statement by Hebron's governor stated that Banat's health deteriorated during his arrest. It further said that he was taken to a hospital where he was announced dead. However, his family has disputed these claims. They were also not aware of his location for hours after his arrest. His death has been termed an assassination. Nizar Banat had been a fierce critic of Palestinian Authority government and President Mahmoud Abbas. He denounced the widespread corruption and repression carried out by the government against Palestinians. His family has said that he was targeted and arrested several times before his death. Two unidentified men shot live ammunition and tear gas into his home in the occupied West Bank in May. Following news of his killings, protests broke out in Ramallah on Thursday. Chants of leave Abbas and the people want the downfall of the regime could be heard. However, the protests were soon met with heavy violence by PA forces who deployed tear gas. Several injuries were reported. Activists said Banat's families are now demanding an in- family are now demanding an independent investigation into his death. Protests also continued on Friday as his funeral was held in Hebron. We now go to the US where a new report has revealed that ICE officials used force to end hunger strikes by detainees. These included invasive procedures such as forced feeding and forced hydration. These findings are part of a new report by the American Civil Liberties Union and Physicians for Human Rights. Released on June 23rd, it is based on over 10,000 pages of official documents and survivors' testimonies. These cover hunger strikes by at least 1,378 people from 74 countries. These strikes took place across 62 detention centers in 24 states between 2013 and 17. One of the asylum seekers cited in the report has launched a hunger strike to protest the poor living conditions. ICE officials retaliated by locking him in a freezing cold room. He was forced fed using a nasogastric tube. He was then transferred to three different facilities before finally being released. Other investigative procedures used in detention centers included forced urinary catheterization and the use of restraints. These medical procedures violate ethical guidelines for medical personnel. They are painful and can sometimes lead to damage and infections. Moreover, participation in a hunger strike is recognized as a political decision and not a medical condition. The report reveals that ICE did not consider alternatives to force feeding in several cases. Hunger strikers were also often placed in solitary confinement. They were either denied or had restricted access to basic necessities like water. Hunger strikes in ICE facilities continue through the COVID-19 pandemic, seeking basic sanitation and safety. They have been met with severe forms of violence including pepper spray, rubber bullets and facility-wide lockdowns. In our next story, a member of Peru's election court has been removed for exhibiting a conflict of interest in favor of Keiko Fujimori. The National Jury of Elections, or JNE, announced the suspension of Magistrate Luis Carlos Arce Cordova on June 24th. 
Arce himself had asked to be removed from the plenary of the court in a letter on June 23rd. This was after the court rejected 10 appeals from Fujimori's right-wing force, popular, popular force party. She has filed hundreds of appeals seeking to annul around 200,000 votes cast in the election on June 6. Socialist candidate Pedro Castillo had won the election with a narrow margin of just around 44,000 votes. The Attorney General's office has appointed Prosecutor Victor Rodriguez Monteza to replace Arce. Meanwhile, the reports of conflict of interest made against Arce extend beyond the electoral process. He is being investigated for the crime of illicit enrichment in the Los Coelos Blancos case. It refers to a prosecution network within the Peruvian judiciary headed by a former Supreme Court judge. He tried to annul a tax investigation into money laundering by Keiko Fujimori in 2018. If convicted, Fujimori could face up to 30 years in prison. And for our final story, we go to Brazil, which is witnessing mass protests against President Jair Bolsonaro. People have condemned the government's failed response to the pandemic, which has led to over 500,000 deaths so far. In the face of this unrest, the state has intensified crackdown on dissent. This has included severe police violence and repression under the dictatorship era national security law. Moreover, critics of authoritarianism and people who identify with anti-fascism in any way have been targeted. Most recently, students and professors from the State University of Sierra were summoned by the police. This was related to a class on fascism which was held in 2018. Here is a video by Brazil Difato on the case. Since the start of its mandate, the Bolsonaro government has been piling up lawsuits and investigations against activities critical of the government and authoritarianism in general. A well-known case of this is that of YouTuber Felipe Neto, who was called to give statements to the police after calling Bolsonaro genocidal. In this climate of persecution, an old case has resurfaced. Students and professors at the Ceará State University were forced to give statements to the police. The motive is a public class given during the 2018 election period about fascism. The accusers are other students from the university who said they felt consternated in their beliefs due to the content of the talks. Francisco Luciano Teixeira Filho is one of the professors who has been accused and says he is surprised by the complaint. In a statement, one of the students even said that none of the accused addressed or tried to personally coerce him. He only says that he felt coerced. They are really trying to silence us, to intimidate us. They know this won't go anywhere because any minimally alphabetized person knows there is no proof. In 2018, the Sera Public Ministry invalidated the lawsuit. However, now, the accusers are trying to frame their complaint within the scope of electoral laws, alleging the use of violence to coerce someone to vote or not, as explained attorney for the accusers. What we have is a vast material showing threats and harassment by these professors on social media inflammatory speeches on campus grounds, in one of which there was even the brandishing of a cold weapon. However, for this lawyer, who is a member of the Brazilian Association of Jurists for Democracy, the accusations don't hold up. If you read the complaint, you'll be amazed at how it's got nothing. It's just a pile of accusations with no proof at all. There are no names, no identification whatsoever. It says there was a threat, but the threat was issued in a bathroom because someone wrote death to fascists on the wall, meaning it's all very vague, very imprecise. From my end, I'm going to continue giving my classes, continue talking about fascism. I believe it's an essential issue for Brazilian society, and I have a societal function in this nation. My consciousness is absolutely at ease that I'm not using violence or serious treat in order to coerce someone to vote or not. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from around the world. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch.